All right, welcome to the new and improved mini lecture on dissolving metal reductions. There are some important reactions in here that fit into the whole umbrella of radical reactions, but more importantly, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a new kind of subheading of organic chemistry, re um, redox reactions in organic chemistry, that I hope will help you keep things straight as we motor on through OCHEM 2. But first, let's talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. We've already learned quite a bit about radical chemistry, understanding the fish hook mechanism for showing radical or unpaired electron electron movement. Certainly looked at the kinds of things that radicals can do. They can couple with each other, they can do atom transfer or hydrogen atom abstraction. They can add to pi molecular orbitals and reactions wise we've seen some very valuable reactions that we can add to our synthetic toolbox such as converting alkanes into something useful like alkyl halides, coming up with allylic bromination meaning wow this is great I can functionalize next door to a double or triple bond and finally this last one we learned about great the way to do something anti-Markovnikov besides hydroboration. So now what? Now we learn something about reductions. So reductions in organic chemistry are a little bit different from what you learned in Gen Chem. In Gen Chem it was all about ionic bonds. For example, FeCl3 somehow, ever, somehow or other gets converted to FeCl2 for example. Well you know that's plus 3, that's plus 2. I've reduced the oxidation state so this is clearly a reduction. All right, or if I have cobalt chloride and it goes up to, uh, cobalt's probably not, we'll make it chromium. Let's say it's chromium, uh, let's see here, make chromium plus 3, goes up to chromium plus six. Hmm, it's obviously lost electrons, so that's clearly an oxidation. So the focus here in Gen Chem and inorganic chemistry is all about gain or loss of electrons. Well, OCHEM is different because we're not talking about um, ionic bonds so much. It's not quite as straightforward. So we don't focus, focus so much on the electrons as we focus on hydrogens and oxygens. So if I have some kind of organic molecule and it undergoes a transformation where say for example I go from methane to, oh uh, no excuse me, haha <laughs> just kidding, I go from let's say methanol to methane, I've added hydrogen and that's a reduction. On the converse, if I start with methane and maybe go up to something like formaldehyde, so <clears throat> CH4 to formaldehyde, I've A number one added an oxygen, that makes it an oxidation, but you should, you should also note that I've lost a hydrogen. So in organic chemistry, if you see a reaction where you're molecules adding a bunch of hydrogens, that's a reduction. And if you see a reaction where your carbons are adding a lot of oxygens, that's an oxidation. We'll see a lot more about our redox chemistry later on. I think it's chapter 19. But for now, what I want you to focus on is this side because that's the rest of chapter 25, adding hydrogens via a radical reaction. So, how does this happen? Well it happens through dissolving metal reductions. What on earth does that mean? It literally means you're dissolving a zero valent metal in some solvent. When you do that, that gives you, believe it or not, solvated electrons. So I can take something like sodium and you know sodium is in group 1A and so it has a single electron when I dissolve sodium in liquid ammonia, it literally, experimental evidence, 
dissolves and in this blue liquid are a bunch of free electro electrons that are solvated by my ammonia molecules. So just by dissolving this up in liquid ammonia, I get Na plus and a whole bunch of electrons just floating around looking for something to react with. So that's what dissolving metals do. They are electron donors, a single electron, aka known, these reactions are also known as single electron transfer reactions. All right, so, so what? Why is this useful? Well, there's a couple of functional groups that are particularly good at sucking up these extra electrons. A number one is alkynes, and when you take an alkyne and add these dissolving metal reagents of sodium metal dissolved in liquid ammonia, you can convert an alkyne into an E-alkene. So it's always E, so it's stereospecific, and I'll just point out that yes, you can see I am adding hydrogens, therefore it has to be a reduction. Now, this is particularly useful if we keep going back, because, boy, not only can I take my alkene and go a thousand different directions from it, making, I can make alcohol, I can make a halide, I can make an epoxide, you know, there's a zillion things I can do with alkenes. But better yet, I can make alkynes from simpler alkynes. I'll even go so far as to say cheaper alkynes. So I can start with a cheap starting material, make a more complicated molecule, and then take that molecule and turn it to a very valuable molecule that has this handle, which I can convert to all kinds of other things. So you want to make new materials, you want to make new medicinals, you want to do anything in the vast world of anything chemistry related, which is just about everything, this is a very good reaction to know. How does it work? Well, it works kind of the way you might expect. We're going to focus on, of course, that little electron. And now it's actually just going to get thrown away. It's going to get thrown away and join up with another electron. So if you think about the fact that a pi bond is really just two unpaired electrons that are paired, as we indicate here, then it makes sense that I can throw this electron to here and one of these two unpaired electrons will pick it up. In so doing, I will get a radical anion because if I color code these and say this is the electron that came from my sodium, well, doesn't have, doesn't matter how you piece it, two electrons sitting there means this is a negatively charged carbon. So what I have here is a radical anion, and you know what to think about carbon with a minus charge. It would really like to react with an electrophile. What electrophile is present? Well, what's in the beaker? I have this in the beaker. I have this in the beaker. Those certainly don't look like electrophiles to me. But you know what? This is one. And granted, it's not a great electrophile by any stretch. But it's a good enough electrophile that it can be a proton donor to that radical anion. And in so doing, it protonates my radical anion. And now I don't have a radical anion anymore. I just have a radical. What's in my beaker? Sodium metal, electrons, 
NH3, lots of NH3, some NH2 minus because I just deprotonated my ammonia. Hmm, what do you think will happen next? Well, that unpaired electron would sure like to pair up with an electron. And so we can envision that here it goes, just plops right together there to give me another anion. And when that anion gets protonated again by ammonia, it protonates in the stereospecific fashion to give me exclusively the E alkene because this methyl group and this methyl group want to be as far away from each other as possible. So this is a completely stereoselective reaction and it's completely chemoselective in that it reduces only, only reduces alkynes. There is no further reaction. The electrons do not add to the double bond. So it goes from the alkene to the alkyne E fashion. That's it. You're done. So that is the first dissolving metal reaction. Let's look at a little quick roadmap here to see <coughs> if we can practice this a little bit. We clearly have a nice terminal alkene here. We have it reacting with something that screams radical. Even though I don't say heat or light, you see that peroxide? You should probably think that that's a radical initiator. We just learned that in the presence of radicals, HBr will add in the anti-Markovnikov fashion. So we should get addition to the less substituted carbon to give me that halide. And that's a good hint that I'm on the right track because we know this is an electrophile. And hmm, so whatever's going on here must be generating a nucleophile. <sighs> well, I don't know. Let's see. So this, we know this should be a base, a base or a nucleophile. Is there anything? that's a good proton donor on my ketone. And this is dragging you way back to the chapter six, acid base chapter. Oh yeah. It's not too difficult to generate an enolate. So this carbon nucleophile is going to happily react with that carbon electrophile in an SN2 fashion to make a new carbon-carbon bond. So I have a CH2, one, two, three, four. I got four CH2s here in a row with a phenyl group at the end. So that's my product right here. Now what can happen? Well, LDA is a very strong base. It's this guy, lithium diisopropyl amide, and we're keeping it really cold. So even though, and I don't believe you've covered this yet, even though I have two different kinds of hydrogens that I can remove because um, they would both generate an enolate, since this guy is kind of bulky, uh, basically bottom line is my LDA removes this hydrogen to give me this enolate, which I think you can see is going to react with that electrophile. So now I have I'm going to move this around here just to leave room for my functional groups. I have this on one side and this on the other. 
Now what? I see those reagents. That says alkyne is going to be reduced. So my final product is do, 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 this plus this. So I am reducing my alkyne to an e-alkene via the dissolving metal reduction. Whew. Okay, so some of the hints you want to pay attention to here are radicals, base, so you got to think proton transfer, base, so you got to think proton transfer, radicals. Think electrophiles and nucleophiles, think mechanism. All right, now We'll skip this to keep this a little bit shorter, but it's always a good idea to wonder, how would you prove that that reaction worked? The birch reduction probably isn't quite as synthetically useful as the dissolving metal reduction to go from an alkyne to an alkene, but it's an important one anyway. I'm not going to go through the mechanism here, just to point out that it is to throwing an electron, in this case, into the aromatic ring, and then protonation. Actually, in this case, they have a little alcohol present, so they protonate via the alcohol. If your substituent on the aromatic ring is electron donating, as this one is, this is where your double bonds end up. If the substituent is electron withdrawing, say a ketone, then believe it or not, your double bonds end up as shown. I'm not sure how solid this uh, regioselectivity is in terms of the double bond, but this is a reaction that is used in synthesis, and I'm again going to keep this short, so I'm not going to go through this just to show you the first slide, which is that in making this fancy schmancy molecule in the red box there, which is fairly complicated, alkaloids are uh, natural products formed in a lot of plant and animal materials. They're often very, very biologically active and useful molecules. But what I would just point out here is that the very first step that they're taking en route to getting all the way to this molecule is a birch reduction, where they are getting a pretty good yield, 73% yield, of the reduced product as shown. So that is it for this uh, particular uh, mini lecture, but I do want to skip ahead to the bad joke at the end because it was a joke that was contributed to me by a student from a few years ago. What do you call it when two people date between May 22nd and June 21st? And that's a big hint, May 22nd and June 21st. Give up? Well, it's Geminal coupling, get it? Gemini, Gemini, and they're becoming a couple, so geminal coupling, like Adamar. Okay, that's enough. That's enough, that's enough, enough. We will see you in class.